Hi everyone, my name is Elaine and today I'm going to be ranking the top 10 Discworld novels by Terry Pratchett. Coming in at number 10 is Jingo. I put this one here because I felt as though it was one of the most well-written novels in the Discworld series up until that point in the series and that his plot had a clear and logical progression, which cannot always be said of Discworld novels, especially those that came early on in the series. Even so, and this is kind of weird to say on this kind of list, I didn't feel as though I was drawn into the story and I feel as though this stems from my sheer lack of interest in most stories surrounding myths mysteries and with a strong political component as well as a lack of new and intriguing characters. Although there were several who came and went throughout the story, 71 Hour Ahmed is the one that really sticks out and he's really just a mysterious policeman which isn't to his sighting as far as I'm concerned. I also felt as though the novel's pace was a tad slow and would have liked it to pick up a bit. With that being said, I did appreciate seeing the cultural differences between Clatch and Ink Morpork and watching Nobby get in touch with his feminine side. Number nine would be Eric. And I like this one because it was a fast paced, fast read. I love the homicidal luggage and bad mouth parrot, which added a lot of humor to the novel. With that being said, Eric isn't a likable character. He's selfish and whiny. He gets upset when Rincewind doesn't do as he asks and when things don't go according to plan. For example, Eleanor isn't as pretty as he expected and has children already, but he does play off of Rincewind pretty well. I like the twitch Pratchett put on hell. It's still hot AF, but there's no typical torture. Instead, victims get to look at each other's vacation photos and more. Oh my! I liked getting to see Rincewind again as well. He's a playful character and I get the impression that Pratchett really enjoyed writing him. I liked how Rincewind was similar to the wizard we met in The Color of Magic, but has also learned from his experiences. We see him walking away instead of running from impending danger to stave it off for longer periods of time, etc. With that being said, I did feel as though this particular novel wrapped itself up pretty abruptly. Rincewind and Eric are being hunted through hell and then the threat is taken away by some demons in need of change, they escape, and the book ends. Like, what? No final encounter of epic proportions? Rincewind's spastic nature doesn't get to save him again? I'm disappointed. Coming in at number eight is Mort. Some things that detracted from this one for me was just that Mort bit, which grew stale pretty swiftly. Basically the bit where everyone would forget to mention Mort's name and often simply refer to him as boy. It also wasn't as humorous as some of the other Discworld novels. With that being said, it put me in a better mood by the time I had finished, similar to the vast majority of Pratchett's Discworld novels. It was also fast paced and seemed to have a logical progression, similar to Equal Rights and some of the other novels that come later in the series especially. It also didn't seem as spontaneous as the first two novels in the Discworld series, which is both good and bad. I think because it made it seem a little more organized as a composition, but again, detracted from it being maybe as humorous and fun as some of the ones that came earlier. I also appreciated how readers got to see death develop as a character from someone who questioned the nature of fun and wondered what the point in a lot of human activity was to someone who could appreciate certain aspects of life and unwind a little. I did appreciate seeing this development to some of the other characters mentioned largely in passing in previous novels, like Isabel, but didn't really enjoy her as a character. She was a tad too obnoxious. I also think Mort was a well-rounded character and relatable. He's just a tad awkward and he tries his best and does things he probably shouldn't on a whim, aka he's a tad impulsive. Coming in at number seven is The Last Hero. I really like this book. I appreciated how it was a fast paced, quick read and felt as though Pratchett's humor bled through the pages. And it was strong humor, the jokes were spot on. I really enjoyed how Pratchett poked fun at heroes and villains and their nature and thoroughly enjoyed the time Cohen spent trying to teach the minstrel how to write a proper saga in particular. With that being said, I didn't feel as though this novel contained any character development and would have liked to see a bit of that. I feel as though the lack of character development stems from the fact it was left out in place of the novel's humor. It basically felt like there was so much humor that the page were bursting with it and there wasn't much room for anything else like character development. I appreciated getting to catch up with Rincewind and Cohen again and enjoyed the illustrations that accompanied the novel, particularly the landscapes. I think I would have appreciated slightly larger text but really don't have anything particularly negative to say about this one. Number six is Interesting Times. It's kind of funny, I don't really know what to say about this one. I feel like I couldn't enjoy it as much as I might have been able because I remembered far more of the plot than I thought I would, which is a bit troubling because I remember really enjoying this one the first time I read it. I think the pace was good but I would have liked to have seen more of the luggage. I really like the luggage. I appreciated how the elements, if you will, of a Rincewind story were abundant in this one. For example, he tried to run from adventure, but it kept on finding him. He kind of stumbled his way through survival and toward aiding in the Horde's victory. He continued to be the craven individual we remembered from earlier Discworld novels, but in a far more organized story. And it was nice to see him interact with Cohen and Two Flower again, and also to meet Two Flower and the Luggage's family, albeit briefly. With that being said, I thought the novel contained the occasional continuity problem. For example, Cohen sits on the throne of the Adjutian Empire, usurping it from its former ruler, even though, unbeknownst to him, he was already dead. Toward the end of the novel, Two Flower retrieves Rincewind from beneath the hill behind the Forbidden City and explains that Cohen is now Emperor. And I couldn't help but be a tad confused since I had thought the old barbarian hero was already the Emperor. I also really liked how the Horde's members played off of one another. I enjoyed Ronald Savaloy's aka Teach's attempts at teaching the aged heroes how to be civilized. It was amusing and this novel was definitely a lot of fun. 
Number five was Witches Abroad. In Witches Abroad, Pratchett uses postmodernism to deconstruct, satirize, and exaggerate several of the stereotypes and unrealistic tropes found in fantasy, fairy tales, folklore, etc. I appreciated how Pratchett incorporated fairy tales into his novel specifically, but sometimes it felt like the novel was a bunch of little stories as opposed to one big story. At the same time, it made the novel feel even more fast-paced than it already is because there were so many stories within the bigger story. I really like Granny as a character even though she can be mean, especially to Margaret. I appreciate her because she's badass. She can glare and or stare people into submission, use headology to get into people's heads and win the day, outsmart and reason her way out of just about any situation. Nanny is also hilarious while Margaret is kind of just there, especially in this novel. I definitely don't feel as though she contributes or gets a chance to contribute as much. The story is the elder pair of witches and I don't find her new agey vegetarian witch personality as intriguing as those of the other witches. Coming in at number four is Wintersmith. I enjoyed this novel. I felt as though it maintained a good pace and was a fun read. With that being said, I also felt as though it was the slowest of the Tiffany aching novels up until that point, although it ended abruptly. There was all this build up to what I thought would be a final showdown between the Wintersmith and Tiffany with appearances from the Fiegel, Roland, and Lady Summer, but that didn't exactly happen. Tiffany got herself out of the story on her own and Roland seemed to fetch Summer for basically no reason at all. Maybe it was easier for her to take her rightful place because she was on the surface now? I don't know. Like I said, the end seems super sudden, like there might had been a drop thread somewhere. I thought it was also a tad odd for Tiffany to accomplish what she did basically on her own. This is an aspect of YA that, that I really struggle with and struggled with in previous novels as well. In this novel, Tiffany is a teenager, but she finds a way to defeat an elemental god. In the other novels she has appeared in, she's even younger and defeats the Hiver and the Elvish Queen. It just seems a tad unrealistic when she received minimal outside help, which is a component of this type of literature. I'm not saying it's impossible for a young person to accomplish things on their own or even do hard things on their own. It just seems unrealistic that they do so much on their own in this type of literature. At the same time, however, I admire it and Tiffany's drive to figure things out on her own. I also love the Fiegel and how they play off one another, especially when Rob is explaining things to the other Fiegel and his clan. I also like how they play off Tiffany, especially when she is upset with them and they start whaley whaleying and such. Finally, I felt as though the first chapter spoiled the story a bit. It basically told us what was going to happen without telling us what was going to happen. I think I would have preferred it if it was not included in the novel. But that being said, it was definitely a fun novel and I really enjoyed seeing Tiffany continue to mature into a stronger and more confident witch and young woman and interact with the other fledgling witches. Number three was Monstrous Regiment. Again, this is a novel that I really like. Obviously, it's number three on my list. I felt as though it maintained a good pace and I enjoyed the narrative style. With that being said, there were a few things that confused me and a few things I was not fond of. First, why did Polly bring her cut hair with her? What possible use could she have for it? It seems stupid. There's a chance that someone could discover it and find her secret out or she'll come off as an extremely weird and creepy since she has a full head of hair in her pack. I also felt as though the recruits were distinct but not particularly memorable. I mean, this is in the sense that they weren't very interesting and will be forgotten shortly after reading this book. For example, Maledicta was trying to fight her vampiric nature. She's obsessed with coffee, which she used to replace her bloodlust. It could be described as being refined to the point of being a tad obnoxious. While Wazer was religious and prays a lot. I know they're minor characters, but I feel as though they should be more memorable and exciting. I shouldn't have to think about who is who most of the time, or in most cases. With that being said, I did enjoy all of their interactions and the plot overall, and it was a good book. Coming in at number two was A Hat Full of Sky. I like this one a lot because I felt as though it maintained a good pace, but wasn't as humorous as some of the other novels that came earlier despite the presence of the Knack Mac Fiegel. Even so, I enjoyed their excursions onto the page, their enthusiasm, their will to fight, their constant cursing and love of drink, love of making fun of one another. With that being said, I'm not sure how I feel about the Hiver, which is you know, the novel's main antagonist. It's afraid of everything and seeks shelter in the strong. It has no mind of its own, yet it is driven to do this. Then kills the host because it doesn't understand them and what they need to survive. It seems contradictory to feel fear, seek shelter, comfort, and allies. Share that ally's mind and then get them killed anyway. Like, doesn't the host still feel hungry and thirsty and stuff? And wouldn't the hiver then feel those cues? And what is a bodiless form that's nearly impossible to kill, truly afraid of? What does it think is going to happen to it? Where does it get this thought it's not supposed to have since it's supposed to lack a mind? I guess I simply feel the explanations of this creature were inadequate and contradictory and raised far more questions than they answered. And this really bothered me. So for me, the draw of this novel was really just Tiffany and the Fiegel and how they played off of each other and how they tried to solve this problem, which, like I said, doesn't always really make sense to me. But that's okay. It's a Discworld novel. I'm not sure how much is supposed to really make sense all of the time, but... Whatever. I like it anyway. And a drum roll, please. Do -do 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 -do. That's not a drum roll, but we'll pretend. Topping my list in the number one spot is the We Free Men. As I've 
may or may not made clear already, I have reread this series and I was so excited to finally read this book again. It was a novel which first got me into the Discworld. I really loved reading it the first time around and the second was no different. I enjoyed this novel for a few different reasons. First, it's fast paced with a playful writing style. Second, I enjoy Tiffany as a character and feel as though she's rather relatable. She enjoys reading and learning and often questions everything. She can be sarcastic and a tad obnoxious and manages to keep a level head in a crisis. She's like a bookworm crossed with Socrates. I also adore the Wee Free Men. I enjoy their playful personalities, the way they play off one another, their love of drink, battle, and adventure, the way they speak. They're definitely a lot of fun and the way they play off of Tiffany is enjoyable. However, the novel's first chapter is kind of all over the place, but the story gets more organized as it goes along for the most part. And there you have it, my ranking of the top 10 Discworld novels. Elaine's gotta have a book with a good pace, some good characters, often of the magical sort, and good humor. What did you think of my list, guys? Was it on point? Was it not on point? What are your favorite Discworld novels? Let me know down below in the comments. I always like to know what you guys think. And also, what do you think makes a good Discworld novel? Is it the same things that I believe, or is it something entirely different? I don't know, but I want to find out. And if you like what you saw here today, please smash that like button until it's blue. Subscribe, ring that bell so you'll know what's up, and I'll catch you all in the next one. Bye, guys.